Okay, so Bonnie's telling me it's time to get going. And it's time to start. So welcome, everybody, to the 44th Paul Lester Marington Memorial Lecture. Thanks for coming out tonight. This uh, appreciated on this rainy weather and rain beginning Visha. And this uh, lecture series is named in honor of Paul Lester Harrington, who uh, worked in population biology, mostly in wetlands of Iowa. Uh, he contributed to the scientific rationale for why predators would not decimate game populations. And lots of people worried about that in his time. Harrington also created the original scientific rationale for, as Aldo Leopold put it, why we can hunt at all. Today we call this the concept of compensatory mortality. And finally, Paul Harrington wrote and he communicated about the values of wetlands. And so if there's a, if there's a land ethic, we also have a marsh ethic, thanks to Paul and Harrington. Um, I wanted to thank uh, this, the person who got this whole lecture series started uh, through a generous donation that started the Harrington uh, what do we call it here? The Arrington Memorial Fund is the first sponsor that we wish to thank. And uh, we would like to recognize Carolyn Arrington, won't you read? Will give us a wave. So thanks for getting this lecture series started. And uh, the rest of the sponsors are listed inside on the program. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Deborah Peters, uh, who received, uh, who grew up in Waverly, Iowa, and received her Bachelor in Science in Biology from an excellent, excellent, in fact, the world's, uh, North America's best land-grant institution, which is, of course, you know the answer. Yeah, Iowa State University. So welcome back to town. Um, and so, this lecture is part of the Iowa State 150th Anniversary Alumni Lecture Series. Uh, Deb continued stu her studies at San Diego State for her master's, and she got a PhD in range science at Colorado State University, and where she continued to make significant contributions to that program. Since 1998, Dr. Peters has served as a research scientist at the Hornada Experimental Range, located in the Chihuahua Desert Ecosystem near Las Cruces, New Mexico. Dr. Peters has been doing many interesting things, and I'd like to just mention just two of them. She's been the lead principal investigator for the Hornada Long-Term Ecological Research Site. And this research range there is no small potatoes. It measures 25 miles from north to south. It's over 700,000 uh, square acres. And so it's a big deal, and it's part of the LTER system here in North America. Secondly, Dr. Peters provided essential leadership when the National Science Foundation established the National Environmental Observation Network. And today we know that as NEON, or the National Ecological Observatory Network. Dr. Peters has been busy writing, publishing not only reports, but many articles. And we've listed a few in tonight's program. I'm sure New Mexico State University is very glad to have Dr. Peters on their adjunct faculty, and we're very glad to have her here with us tonight for the 44th Paul Arrington Memorial Lecture. Her topic this evening is Continental Scale and Ecology in a Connected World. Show and welcome Dr. Deb Peters. Everyone in the back, it's okay. Okay, thank you, James, for uh, setting everything up and for inviting me. Thank you for having me back. It's great to be back at Iowa State. Um, I grew up in Waverly, and as a kid, I really didn't know what college was all about. I no one in my family went to college, so I just knew I needed to go, and I, it was going to send me places. And this was the absolute best place I could possibly come. And it was clear there was no way I was going to Iowa City, right? There's no way I was going to the University of Iowa. Somehow I knew I needed to come here, and some days you have to, have to go with your instinct, right? And it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. And you came to Land Grant University, and I just stayed in that system 
for the last X number of years. <laughs> We're talking about how long it's been. But I, I can tell you that if you make these decisions with your kids that you don't know why, right? And they have a huge impact on you as you go through life. And I can tell you that the grounding that I got in terms of academic and an introduction to research at Iowa State University has really served me well as I've gone through life. And it, it was just a fantastic experience. Um, I also want to thank you for inviting me to this lecture. This is a fantastic opportunity um, to, to actually honor now Paul Arrington's work. And so I really am pleased and honored to be part of the, of the series uh, that I'm speaking in tonight. Uh, what I want to do tonight is just talk a little bit about um, work I've been doing over the last couple years that connects into, James mentioned, the NEON program. And so I'll just talk a little bit about that. But if you want more information, I can certainly talk to people in more detail later tonight or tomorrow. That the, the idea is that sort of we're, we're all connected, and we know that we're all breathing the same air right now, right? But the, what I want to talk about is more connected in terms of um, events that result in increased connectivity or decreased connectivity. And hopefully that'll, that'll be clear as we go through. So there are, there are really three things I want to do uh, tonight. So this is sort of the roadmap, and I'll, I'll remind you as we go through. But first, I want to convince you that the world is connected in important ways, and it's important for us to know that, okay? The second one is that we, we can deal with it. Okay, we, we know it's important, but we have a framework to actually deal with it, both for understanding and then prediction. Okay, so that's sort of the, the encapsulated version of the talk. So what do I need by connectivity? It's really just a transfer of material, seeds, and information by wind, water, animals, and humans to other places. So when we think about connectivity, a lot of times it's just sort of I can connect, I can talk, I can actually touch someone. And that's, I really want to get beyond sort of that level of connectivity, talk about event-driven connections. And hopefully I have a number of examples that will make that clear to you and why these event-driven connections are actually really important. So they don't actually have to be adjacent. So these connections I'm talking about, and you'll see in the examples, can be a very far long distance away that actually have important impacts. Okay, so, so just some examples of what I'm talking about in terms of connected world. Um, this is the, the Dust Bowl. Uh, they like to, first of all, of course, you're very familiar with this, I hope, that called the Dirty Thirties by some people. And so it's a period from in 1930 and 40 in the Midwest. So actually, this, this was the area they considered to be the Dust Bowl. And it was a period of very um, hot weather with low precipitation. And what I'd like to do is to show you how this, it actually, you can see that it was dry throughout the U.S., but this really, if we looked at all the years, this was the really critical area, but how it had impacts nationally. So it was actually preceded the 1920s with, with government policies that favored the cultivation of increasingly marginal land, okay? All of these, actually, it's so great to be able to put together talks like this because there's so much on the web, right? So none of these I took, but these, it's all available now on the web. So extreme dr extended drought, so it wasn't just one year of drought, but really a, a period of about 10 years of really dry times, really hot, very windy. So now we have our plants are dying, so we've got much high, we've got high uh, bare areas, so low plant cover. You can imagine then when it starts blowing, what happens? We start getting these huge dust storms. So this unprecedented increase in soil erosion, blowing dust, tornadoes, they actually documented that some of this dust was from the Great Plains was found on the East Coast. It's amazing, these storms are just, just amazing to look at. So these, these, these storms actually likely, we don't know because we didn't have people actually studying that now, but they studied, this, studied that then, but they do study this now. But it likely interacted with the atmosphere to make it even drier and windier. So it had sort of land-atmosphere interactions that, that increased the severity of the drought. The result is we had even greater reduced rainfall and increased temperatures. And actually, these, these types of feedbacks still happen today in Africa. So we can still have large areas of land that actually have these sort of erosional events that can increase the dust load in the atmosphere that then reduce the rainfall. Okay, so clearly I hope that you see that we had this very localized event, but it had huge implications at a much larger scale. So you've probably heard of these in terms of reading on Steinbeck's book. This is an excellent book that is out now, The Worst Hard Time by Egan. It's just an excellent book about the Dust Bowl. So it happened, this is, you can sort of see the, the image here, and it just propagated across the country. Loss of life, reduced quality of life, agricultural depression. Well, yeah, there are other examples. So that's sort of a state, as far as we know, anyway, at that time, there weren't any implications beyond the U.S. But wind and dust storms can actually connect continents as well. So this is an image from uh, 19, 
2004, I believe, or 1998, April 98. So it's actually a huge Asian dust storm that propagated across the Pacific Ocean and actually landed in the U.S. So we can also have dust storms that are just huge that actually go across the continents. So wildfires also allow connectivity across continents and then also between land and ocean by wind. So this is now from uh, 2003, those large uh, wildfires we had in California. So you see the different ignition points. Now they're just then increasing in size and actually as they get larger, they start to interact with each other and create an even larger um, event. Okay, we also have hurricanes that connect continents. So the first examples were wind, and now hurricanes are wind and water. We talked about connectivity by our different vectors. So we're just gonna move through those. So wind and water is the second one. And actually, uh, it turns out that thunderstorms off the coast of Africa sort of pop off the coast. And sometimes, there are lots of them that pop off the coast, but sometimes they actually create hurricanes that influence the US. So this is a track of Hurricane Hugo in 1989. And they actually move through different types of stages, so they don't start as a thunderstorm and then all of a sudden pop into a hurricane. But they become a tropical depression and some sort of die out. And some become a tropical storm and some die out. And some actually become a hurricane and they're, then they're a problem. But they actually connect the different um, continents in this way by wind and water. Okay, and again, then hurricanes, the impacts then spread nationally. So they don't just hit one area like Katrina and stop there. But you probably had Katrina people here. We certainly had Katrina um, people that were affected that came to Las Cruces, and we had medical people that were sent to Louisiana. So certainly there are consequences beyond just the localized effects of the hurricane. Okay, another really nice uh, water example is the tsunami. So in this case, what I've talked about before, things started small and got big. In this case, tsunamis start big as far as we know and they actually then decrease in, in size and intensity through time. So this was a tsunami of 2004 that started off Indonesia and actually was huge, and then it slowly propagated across the ocean and then it got smaller and smaller. But again, it's connecting these different continents at a very large scale. Okay, water also provides connectivity within and among countries. And so this is now, um, of course, you are familiar with the Mississippi River Basin and how the different basins connect, and then, of course, you know, sediment and water flow that actually influences the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so we did wind and water. The third one was humans. This is now a classic example of SARS, right? The severe acute respiratory <coughs> syndrome that we were worried about, certainly in 2003. So this is, a, this is the global map of how it sort of started in, in the province in China. We're actually not exactly sure when it started there, but you know, we did have cases in the US, I mean, because we're traveling globally now. So humans are spreading diseases and other things globally, so we're connecting continents as well. This figure is just showing through time, but actually you can see within just a few months. The first cases that we know of were in November in a province in China. There were 305 is what, is what we're told. By uh, February it was in Hong Kong, but by May, May, I mean from October, to, from November to May, we had over 7,000 cases globally. Right, and we've moved very, very rapidly. So again, a very fairly small event that had just sort of global implications that affected lots of people. And then the last one had to do with um, the transport by um, animals and the movement of seeds. And so these are just different um, invasive species that have moved from different continents onto the, onto the North American continent, and then they're spread across the continent. So the red indicates where they are now, <coughs> The yellow is the potential for their spread based on environmental conditions. And then the dark red, we, we were expecting to have the greatest impact. So cheatgrass is an annual plant that's just creating havoc throughout the western U.S. Okay, so those examples just for to be a feel that just convince you that, we, yes, we do in a connected, live in a connected world where discrete events can actually propagate at really large-scale consequences. So how do we deal with this then? How do we synthesize all this information to actually make sense of it and then understand and what we want to do is then predict. Okay, so this, I don't want to go into this in any detail, but this is a framework that um, I actually presented the basics of this at the NEON meeting that James talked about that we had that planned actually uh, a bunch of proposals to the National Science Foundation to drive the ideas of NEON. And so people in this room were actually there in Las Cruces in November, about a year and a half or so ago. 
And then we've been refining this through time. And, and as you'll notice, that what I've done is I've got a number of papers down here. And we now have a special issue coming out in Frontiers in College and Environment in June. That's a series of uh, six papers based upon the ideas that were generated in that meeting. And this is the framework that we're using. And it's basically we have sort of, this is what we want to predict, right? Big scale patterns and dynamics, whether it's continental or global. And we have big scale drivers like climate, land use. We also have disturbances like fire, and these are influencing our system. And so what we're suggesting is the system is actually fairly complicated. So it includes both plants and animals, and includes terrestrial systems and aquatic systems, and you have to look at things at cross scales. So ecologists, I'll speak for the next time, ecologists are great at looking down, and we call that the plot scale, and not looking around. And I'll talk about that in more detail in a minute, but essentially what we're doing is we're saying, well, some of the, sometimes you can actually look down, this is sort of the fine scale look down, because you have to understand the processes occurring at fine scales, one individual versus another, but you also have to know how those individuals are connected, and that's what all this large box has to do with. So we don't need to go into the details, but I talked about the vectors, wind, water, animals, and people, okay, what's being moved around, seeds, water, soil, disease, I showed examples of those, and then what really makes it connect together is habitat heterogeneity. So that's what is the glue that makes this actually work. So that's sort of the gist of the model, or the framework. What I have is sort of the simpler version that I, that I published in Bioscience uh, last year, or two years ago now. But this essentially, if you can sort of encapsulate these ideas, what do you need to do if you, when you go to the field? And as I said, most ecologists, a lot of times, <laughs> will look down. They, go to, they sort of go to a plot and they measure things, right? But I'll show you some examples of why that doesn't work very well. You can imagine already, given the examples I've showed you, that if, you're, if a hurricane comes through, it doesn't matter how detailed information you have on the, on the number of plants, because the hurricane's going to come through and just wipe everything out. So the information you have may be totally overwhelmed by this large-scale process. So that's the idea of sort of looking up and seeing what's around you in terms of your broad-scale drivers, and then look around in terms of what's moving across the landscape, whether it's seeds or water or soil. And then we want to look back in time, and I'll give an example in a minute about how historic legacies are so important in terms of what we see today. And then, of course, we want to look forward in time. How, how are these systems going to change if we have a change in climate? What if it does increase in precipitation? What happens? So this is essentially what that previous figure was saying, only a very much simpler way. So I'd like to do is go through each of these and give an example. But first of all, let's see if this works, right? So we have the Dust Bowl. So the Dust Bowl, everyone seems to be able to sort of connect with the Dust Bowl. It seems to make sense. Well, does it actually work with this framework? Well, we have a broad scale driver, right? It's, this, it's drought. Okay, that's our driver. We have transport processes, wind. So wind is moving things around. People certainly were as well. I didn't talk about water erosion, but certainly in the Midwest you've heard about the water erosion problems with the Dust Bowl. So we have fine scale processes. We can't ignore what's going on at a fine scale. Here our plants were dying, right? So we could actually go out and measure the plant mortality. Um, there was also soil loss at individual sites. Certainly the history was very important. The government policies in the 20s actually set this up because the farmers were increasingly cultivating marginal land instead of really high quality land that would then erode in the future. So we really don't have a future element here. We could do that. We could predict um, for Africa based upon this situation what we might expect, but that's not really part of the problem right now. So the result is we had this spatial spread of soil erosion, loss of vegetation, probably with feedbacks to the atmosphere. So it, it does seem to work. And this is, this is what we've, we've, when we hear about the dust bowl, a lot of times we hear about these sort of things disconnected. So we hear about the climate, the drought, oh, it's the drought. And we hear about, well, the farmers are plowing. Well, how do you put those two things together? And our framework allows us to do that. So first of all, we had every farmer was doing their own thing. So they were going out and plowing these lands. And then what would happen was it get dry, so plants would die, and you get erosion within each field. That's fine. The problem was everyone was doing it, right? So now we have lots of fields that are actually being plowed and abandoned and erosion. And now you have it set up so the wind is not just eroding the soil on your field, but now your field is now creating soil erosion on the next person's field and the next person's field. And they're now highly connected across the landscape. And that's what we're suggesting created these huge dust storms. And so they're actually, these fields are highly connected. So at this point in time, it didn't really matter if we had another farmer doing his field because we've already got these big scale processes happening. So it seems to work. That, that's sort of the, the gist of it. Our, our framework seems to provide information to the past. And just, just to give you a feel for this is how sort of we would sort of put this together. 
through time, these things have gotten, they got large, right? So this is, if we start in uh, 1900 and go to 1950 or so, this is what we expect would have happened. And so it got started small, individual farmers um, plowing fields, and then it actually got very large in terms of these connections and these huge dust bowls. And what happened was we went through a series of steps that resulted in, that were a we result, they were caused by different processes. So first of all, it was initiation, so they went out and plowed their fields. And then what happened was there was a change because now we've got a lot of people starting to plow their fields and they're starting to be abandoned. And now if we've got sort of within patch erosion is happening because it's getting drier and drier. And now as more people start to plow their fields, now our with among patch connections are getting really large. Everybody's sort of connected and then it sort of blows up and we have these land atmosphere feedbacks and now we get these huge dust bowls. So these we call thresholds, which are points in time which is an reflection in the curve. So if we had actually gone out in the early 1920s and said, well, based upon the current rate of change of the number of fields and the erosion, and predicted what would happen in 1950, we would have been really off. And that's the key thing about thresholds. And you have to know where those inflection points are, because the slope is very different along those. So it's important to know that these processes are changing, and they're associated with these thresholds. So the, the framework seems to work OK for the past. So now, can we use this as a strategy for understanding our current problems? OK, so first step was to look up. OK, so we say, OK, let's identify our broad scale drivers for a particular problem. And I always keep it sort of general, but essentially we have a climate is, is connects us globally, right? No one's going to argue with that. Climate is actually a little more complicated because it isn't, well, you know, globally what's happening doesn't determine the rain that we have today. But actually, I mean, it determines sort of broad scale patterns in vegetation. So it shows where the deserts are, right? The still is going to determine what's in my backyard. So in order to understand that, you need to actually understand a couple more scales associated with climate. So you hear people talk about El Nino events and how it's six cycles of wet and dry periods. So those actually are regional processes. Those are not global processes. And then, of course, this is the, the research site that, that James mentioned where I work the Hornada External Range. And we have mountains along here. So it's actually wetter up in the mountains than it is down the basin. So actually what determines the rainfall really is a combination of all these different processes. Okay, we have, we have other large scale processes like nitrogen deposition. Um, this is actually these, a number of these are going to come out in, in Nancy Grimm's paper in our special issue. Uh, wildfires of course have a spatial distribution across the U.S. Mostly this is uh, initiation, so mostly in the West. You can see that the brown is the largest um, nitrogen deposition. This is a land use, so change in the percent exurban over a period of time. So this shows you where the cities have been, have been occurring over the last, uh, since 1950, the last 50 years. So the red would indicate where more cities have happened. And then this is sort of a new approach that Nancy Grimm is promoting in terms of megapolitan regions. So if you actually want to study cities and land use, you would go to these areas where they're really rapidly changing, like the Phoenix-Tucson corridor or the Denver um, Front Range. So there are the, the urban ecologists are more thinking now in terms of not, not studying every city, but actually looking at the, sort of these large areas and comparing how those might respond. So certainly land use is another large scale sort of uh, driver. So step two is we wanted to, we need to stratify the continent to regions based on key broad scale drivers. So this is now, we're still, we're still looking up. Right? This is our still broad scale drivers. But we need to deal with them in some way because it doesn't, we don't have the same rainfall here as we do in Colorado, as we do in New Mexico. There are patterns in those. So if we look across the U.S., we can actually separate the U.S. into three major regions based upon precipitation and temperature. So of course, temperature goes from warm to cool across the U.S., right? But precipitation is more complicated. So of course, in the central U.S., we go from wet to dry as we go from east to west. But in the east, we actually go from wet to dry as we go from the south to the north. And we do the same thing in the west. So what this allows us to do is to separate the con into three different regions. And of course, land use patterns are different. Nitrogen deposition patterns are different. So if we overlaid all those maps, it actually come up with three regions that have fairly different dynamics at the big scale. And then we need to, as part of this, so we need to then, how, how are we going to study it? Okay, so we have broad scale drivers. We know what they are. We know their broad scale patterns. But then we need to put sites down. And so this is actually this is a project that I started uh, actually after the NEON meeting. We had uh, 250 sites or so that contributed to that NEON meeting uh, in Las Cruces. And so we had all this information about all these sites. And what we're doing now is we're putting it on a web page. 
So you can actually go to this Pearl's webpage and say, well, okay, I want to study all the grassland sites between you know, 800 millimeters and 1,000 millimeters a year precipitation at a certain temperature, <coughs> show them to me globally. And that would actually allow you to then you know, select your sites very easily. So one thing you're trying to do is to make data and information very easy to access. And so this allows you a way to then select your sites by stratifying across these drivers. So we can use existing networks, like the LTR network. There's 26 sites in our network. They're set across the different biomes. There's also a USDA forest service sites. There's agricultural research sites. There's also biological field stations. So there are a lot of existing networks we can use. And then we have emerging networks like NEON and others like WATERS, which is associated with um, water aquatic <coughs> systems. So what I want to do is sort of pull all this stuff together and put it into a, a database and a website that's very easy for people to actually access. Okay, so a specific example out of one of the other papers in our issue is, um, let's say you're interested in sea level rise. So you actually determine the pattern in sea level rise, and of course it's along the coast, but there's a variation in terms of whether it's going to predict it to change a lot or a little. And now you place your sites down to actually match those changes. So you have the driver, the, the sea level rise, and you have your sites. And so you can actually select sites. And notice what they've done is they said, okay, we're going to go along the coast, but we're also going to go inland, because we know that there's going to be an effect of sea level rise on the inland forests and the inland cities. So they actually are not just on the coast, but they're actually also inland because of the connectivity issue. Okay, so that was all actually step one in terms of find out what those broad scale drivers are and how they're connected. The second, one of the other steps was to just look around. This is an example that I want to go into detail. Essentially, this is for the real brand. So let's say, okay, it's fine for people working at the continental scale, but most people don't work at the continental scale. So we work at the real brand. So this is uh, New Mexico, Colorado, and down into Mexico. So the real brand basin actually starts in Colorado, runs along Texas, it goes out of the Gulf of Mexico. So we actually have sites we said, okay, we, the, there's a gradient of precipitation, temperature, snow melt. Invasive species tend to go along the water corridors. So we actually have all these gradients that we can look at along this Rio Grande Basin. It provides a nice structure for us to study. So we located our sites along the river as well as the Hornada actually doesn't touch the river, we're up, up with the slope of it. And then we can look at um, invasive species, so this is salt cedar. So we can then look at the dynamics of different um, species through time, as well as these are having invasives. This is another example we, of our history. Um, so for us, uh, we had some influence from the east as the continent was settled. But we also had a very strong influence from the Spaniards coming up from Mexico, talking about New Mexico. So we, we can't ignore that. And here's an example. So the Camino Real was the uh, highway, basically. It wasn't a highway, but it was the road that got people from Mexico City to Santa Fe. And so they were moving goods and services along this in the 1500s to 1800s. And we can actually see that imprint on the landscape. So this is a historic Camino Real. And you can see these are the dark green are mesquite shrubs. So we have a grassland, and actually they were moving cattle along the Camino Real. And they were then, <coughs> the cattle eat mesquite, if they poop it out, and then the mesquite gets started, and then it starts to spread across the landscape. So we have to actually acknowledge this importance of history. Okay, so this is just a, a detailed example of the, what I just told you about the Camino Real. But this is sort of a nice um, illustration. So here's the Camino Real from Santa Fe, Mexico City. The Rio Grande then runs through New Mexico. So the, here's our research site. Uh, El Paso is actually right here. So we're right near El Paso, Texas. And then uh, Santa Fe is here. Here's the river. And then, of course, Colorado is up here. And if you ever want to look for really cool stuff like this, you look for the space station images. This stuff is great. So at least it gives you a feel for our context. And then, of course, this is a blow-up of the slide I showed you previously. So you can see that these are shrubs along the Camino Real, and then they're spreading out uh, through time. So our history is really important. We wouldn't be able to predict this pattern without knowing that, that you know, historic highway was actually there. We would have no way of knowing why those shrubs were there. Okay, another step then was to look down and to look around. So one of the things we want to do is to actually conduct sampling to then, so okay, we have a lot of pattern analysis, right, that we've done in our previous ones. Now we actually actually want to look at, well, what would we do then to actually study this? So historically what we've done is we've looked down, we've studied plots, or we've studied the same thing in many different places, but we don't really look at how those things are connected. 
So we need actually new approaches that account for this connectivity. So here's a back to the Dust Bowl. Here's a historic example, and I think that this is actually what we're still doing today. So research sites were established in the Great Plains, and these are some of them by the same people, Albertson and Weaver and others, and they were doing they were actually doing the same measurements at these sites. And if you go into their literature, you'll see that they, they did a great job. They actually um, monitored all the plants through time, they actually charted them, they could actually see what plants were changing. But they, they never said anything about the possibility that these things could actually be connected and affecting the dust bowl. So they were actually doing all the same measurements by the same people, the same sites, and they really didn't make a connection to this bigger scale process. And I think we do the same thing actually today. So this is what, this is the, the LTER sites. We do this, <laughs> we're still doing this. So I'll see people at, at meetings will say, well, you have a drought this year, oh yeah, we do. But we never actually, well, okay, is, you know, is a, what's happening on my site influencing your site? We never really get into that, and I think this is where we, this is where our future is. We have to actually look at those connections. And there are other examples of Forest Service. Everyone's sort of really interested in getting a good handle on their site, and the NSF always calls us drilling down. We drill down into the details of the site. We need to actually look at how the sites are connected and how those dynamics are connected. And Neon is, is an emerging network that we hope will actually do this, but it's unclear yet if they're going to actually tackle these, these difficult problems. So how would we then do this with this connectivity framework? Well, this is another uh, uh, project that I started a few years ago with some people with an LTER. It's very important to know the context. And so if we start a new research project today and you start from scratch, how do you know that the patterns you see in the next three years of your research grant are anomalies or they actually are a trend? You actually have to know the historical context in order to know that those dynamics are actually related to precipitation <coughs> or temperature or maybe an animal got into your plots. So what we're doing is we're taking all the LTR sites, so 26 LTR sites, and everyone's been very good about we have to put our data on the website. But I can guarantee you that if you go to any of these websites and you say, I want primary production for this site, you'll have a very difficult time getting to that data. So how can we possibly synthesize across sites if we don't, if we can't access the data? So this project is called Ecotrends. What we're doing is we have 26 LTR sites, we have 24 additional forest service sites and ag research sites, the DOE site, sort of accumulated sites. We're taking all their data to make it very simple. And then the simple idea was you have an Excel spreadsheet and the first column is year, and then the other columns are response variable. So all that very complicated data gets dissolved down in some very simple spreadsheet. <coughs> So I can then graph production at a grassland site in Kansas, a grassland site in Iowa if there was one in this group, so it's all long-term data, a grassland site in Utah, and I can actually pull all those very easily and look at how those dynamics are changing. So that, that's the gist of this. We've got a book that's about 80% done, and then our website I will probably launch in the next couple of weeks. So check out this website um, now if you want to, or certainly within a month. You'll see that you'll actually be able to say, I want nitrogen deposition, uh, for whatever sites, and that's what these data actually happen to be, is nitrogen deposition, <coughs> and also nitrogen in stream water. And so it's from three different sites, and we have, it's just 1,200 data sets now in this thing. So the whole idea is to allow people to actually do these synthetic analyses and understand the history. Okay, so then we also need to then explicitly design studies to look at these connections. And this is back to sort of pearls. We're trying to actually allow people to access research sites and get to know the sites and then be able to go there. So otherwise, if, I'm, if I want to study something, a lot of times I think about who do I know that works you know, in Missouri? <laughs> who do I know that works in Colorado? But we need a more objective way to do that, and that's what Pearls is doing. So you can actually go and find out what the precipitation temperature are and set up those parameters and then select your sites objectively. They could be in Hungary, they could be in China. We're, we're filling this sort of globally. Okay, so we have a strategy for understanding. I hope I, so I've convinced you. We actually, we, connectivity is important, and we have a strategy for it, and we, we can understand past dynamics, and we sort of have a way to go forward, but what we really want to do is predict, right? What's going to happen? It's always nice to know that the dust will happen and why, but we want to know the, how do we use that information to predict the future. Okay, so we want to do two things, and from the examples, you'll see some of them were, were events that started tiny, like the thunderstorms off Africa, and they created a hurricane in North America. So we need to know the conditions under which these fine-scale processes actually propagate to get big. 
And if we know that, then we can actually do something about them. So if we knew which thunderstorms popped off South Africa and developed into major hurricanes, we might be able to do something about those. But right now, we just know there are lots of them that pop off, and some make it and some don't. The other thing we need to be able to do is predict the conditions under which broad-scale drivers, like drought, completely overwhelm your fine-scale dynamics. So if you're doing very detailed plot-scale studies, which are actually still very important, but, but a large-scale drought comes on top of it and completely shuts everything down, we need to know those, those conditions as well. Okay, this is the, the, I've already sort of talked about this, but the hurricane is a great example of a fine-scale process that actually then becomes really large and it also is the reverse, where now it's really large, and if you're studying um, tree demography and competition off the coast of Louisiana, you're, you're not going to understand at all what's going on if you don't know that a hurricane came through last year. So you really need to understand these big scale processes. So hurricanes are a great example of both the fine getting big, right, thunderstorm to large, and when you get to this point, now that's going to overwhelm everything on the ground. So these principles also apply to landscape scale. What I don't want you to just come out of here and say, well, that's a nice thing for continental scale ecologists. <laughs> but actually, these principles apply at any, at any scale. So here's a landscape scale example. And this is actually one that um, I worked on before the continental scale. It's just sort of, we worked on these things at the Hornada, and then we just sort of blew them up globally. So this is an example at the landscape scale. The Hornada, um, if you go in the southwestern US, you see shrubs nearly everywhere. You know, see the mesquite or creosote. And if you could have gone back in 1850, it would have been huge grassland. So we've had this major conversion from a grassland that I think is really appealing to a shrub-dominated system that is um, not so appealing. If you fly into El Paso, it's a moonscape, right? So we've had this conversion. We've been studying that at Hornada for a long time. Hornada was established in 1912. <coughs> and this is the, actually the topic of my talk tomorrow, is sort of how do we deal with those dynamics in sort of this spatially explicit way. But it, it, I always envisioned that the Hornada researchers in 1933 could almost see the shrubs moving across the landscape. You know? And so they put up these explosions, and they were not small, they were miles square. And as James said, we have big research sites, but they're a mile square. And notice the name was a natural revegetation exposure. So one half of it was grassland, and one half of it was mesquite. And so the, the southern half was grassland, and the northern half, was, the other way around, was mesquite. And they thought if we put it up and keep the cattle out, it will naturally revegetate to grassland. Okay, that was the idea. But very much of a look down sort of approach, right? If we just keep the animals out. So we can watch this. So this is uh, taken on the ground at this point in, in space. This is in 1943, the first image that we have, 48, I guess. Um, so this is taken here at the northern end. And you can see by 1948, the black, darker is the grassland and the light is the shrubland, so it's not even 50-50 anymore. It's already the shrubs have moved into the, the grassland part. But we can sort of watch this through time. So by 1987, here's our exposure. Um, so the shrubs are expanding across the landscape. What's, what you can note in this is, th note this area here. What happens is we get these uh, mesquite that come in, and they're actually for, sort of attractive as trees. But then what happens is we get this wind erosion, they create dunes, and they're like taller than me. So the grassland will be flat, and then you get these huge dunes that develop. And uh, this is a huge duneland. So this will all be sort of grass shrubland. This is still our grassland down here in the dark, and this is an area that's huge mesquite dunes, okay? As you might expect, that dune land is going to explode across the landscape. So that by just a period of a little over 10 years, it actually exploded across the landscape. It didn't matter if there was an explosion there or not. It, it totally went through, went through the explosion. Now this is all dominated by mesquite dunland. So studying plant-animal interactions, the effects of cattle and grazing on different plants within this exposure, we've totally missed the dynamics. What's interesting is if we had put this exposure down here, we might still be talking about the importance of cattle, right? So it really is important where you put these things and to have multiple arrangements. But certainly it didn't make at all any difference that we removed the cattle from this area because the dunes just totally exploded across the landscape. So this is a photo that I took. Uh, these are actually well documented, started back in 2001. It's very hard to get the dune sort of structure. But this is, these are mesquite plants, and then uh, the dune structures are just these huge sort of mesquite, and then bare area, and then mesquite. And that's throughout this area now. So that's a landscape example. So I think that these principles actually apply at all scales. 
this is sort of, I've talked all about connectivity in terms of increasing connectivity, right? And I wanted to at least talk a little bit about disconnected systems and how we're actually disconnecting things. And I think this one should hopefully resonate with some people in the audience that your, your grasslands, you have a lot of remnant prairies that have totally become disconnected through time as you're basically your corn and your soybean fields have become connected through time. Okay, so there, both of the connections and disconnections go together a lot of times if you think about it. Um, so this is actually the current grasslands are in the blue and green, and the historic grassland area was, of course, you know, is much larger. So I think that the principles apply in the same way to disconnection systems. And now if you might, if, you're, if this is what you want to do, you might actually think about well, how do we actually connect those systems back up again. Okay, so how do we use this approach to predict dynamics? And this is a nice, again, it's a, it's a landscape example, but it's really nice. The Storm King Mountain Fire was um, outside Glenwood Springs in Colorado, I recall in July 1994. And I believe there were nine firefighters that lost their life in this, in this fire. And so let's just sort of, um, we can examine the fire dynamics, and then we'll think about it in terms of our framework. So the fire actually started, it was, it was probably ignited by lightning up here. And so H1 is where the helicopter landed and put the firefighters out. And there was another, there was another one down here somewhere that was a sort of an escape route as an H2, but they were both up here. So the idea was that the, initially it, it stayed fairly local. It was just affected by the fine scale, fine scale fuel load, right, where it actually hit. And then it started to spread. And because the wind was moving down, so that's where, that's where it went. And so this is probably when the guys landed the firefighters up here is when it was starting to go down slope. So I don't they probably didn't start when it's up here. So our fire is moving this direction, so they put the firefighters up here. Of course they then follow the fire. What happened was it shifted around instead of going down slope, it now started to cut around the mountain and then it started to go actually up slope. Because the wind actually there was an important interaction between the wind and the fire and the vegetation. And so now the wind just shifted around completely very rapidly within hours. And you can see that now our firefighters are actually caught. Right? And then they're scrambling up the hillside to try to get away. Because they thought the fire was going to continue to go down slope when they were fine. So it shifted around these broad scale wind dynamics then very rapidly moved the fire across the landscape and they were caught. So they could actually just, they were, they were literally running. And so now we get these huge blow ups that can happen when the the fires actually get so large that they're generating their own weather. Well, we, we have, I went into the, the post-fire report. They, of course, there were huge analyses on how could this possibly have happened. And so if we go back to the post-fire report, there are some really telling statements in there that I think fit right into our framework. So one was that topography influenced the local wind patterns. So now we have, it wasn't just that the wind was moving down slope, but it actually interacted with the topography. And then the vegetation topography uh, reduced the visibility. So it's all connectivity, right? Everything's connected. And the bulb was not related to the vegetation. So it didn't matter how much vegetation was there. It started out related to vegetation, and then the wind overwhelmed all of that. So if they were doing an analysis based upon fuel load, they would have been wrong, because it really had a lot more to do with how the fuel load was interacting with the wind and the atmosphere and shifted the direction of the fire. So again, now this is our look down, around, and up. So it fits into our framework. It also fits into sort of our look around backward and forward. So they could not predict this fire based upon all of their past experience. So they were using, they have, they have fire chiefs, and they were using the best knowledge they had in terms of where the vegetation was, where the topography was, where the wind was going. And this was not sufficient then to allow them predict, to predict this major shift in the wind direction. So they, they actually looked back, but it didn't provide them the information they needed because they didn't have the connectivity framework. So the escape routes actually should consider potential fire behavior rather than just past or present fire behavior. So looking forward and, and looking at the possible scenarios. And then this connectivity of fuel mass interacting with fire and wind. They said the probability of high intensity fire spread is related to both the duration and the spatial extent of the fire. So where they're actually looking at how these are interacting. And this rapid transition from a very slow moving fire that they had under control going down slope to this very fast moving high intensity fire occurred very quickly. I mean, they really had to make decisions very quickly. So they really had to be thinking more in terms of where is it possible that it might go based upon connectivity. So I think that we can use this framework and, and these very simple sort of concepts of looking up, around, 
down, backwards, and forwards to, to actually understand and predict them behavior. Okay, so it's increasing, connectivity is increasing in many cases. I gave you lots of examples because those are always sort of fun and they're really important. But it's also decreasing, which is really important for, for this part of the country in terms of fragmentation. Uh, so we need to understand it in order to predict system dynamics. There is a danger of overconnected systems. Um, well, first, the small world effect, have you heard of that, where we're all connected within six degrees of freedom to everyone in the world? So they've done this uh, sort of simple analysis on who do you know and how do you know, and you actually we're within 60 people of everybody in the world. That's the small world effect. And that's just based upon who you know, right? So th this is a really interesting example of a, if you get too overconnected, it's a problem. So this is Mars, and you can see that there, there's a huge dust storm shown on this image of Mars. Um, and what happened is it happened within two weeks and it engulfed the entire planet. It's just amazing. So by June, this is June 2001, this is a, just sort of a regular situation, so it's clear skies, and then it's, you can see that the dust storm is starting to build. It starts pretty small, right, in terms of the, the planet, and the red is the dust storm in, in the intent, high intensity, and then the green and the yellow are less intense dust storms. And it's just by July 8th, from June 24th to July 8th. It totally engulfed the planet. So there are some concerns if we get too overly connected. Okay, so just in conclusion then, uh, the, the world is connected by these different, um, what we call transport processes. So wind, water, animals, and humans. And there are important consequences, not just for ecology, but also social, economic, and political. We talk about sort of the, the Dust Bowl and, and intercontinental connections. And then we have a better understanding of this um, in terms of how things can start small and get big in a hurry uh, and create these surprises at large scales. We also have a better understanding of how these broad scale drivers can overwhelm completely what we're studying at a small scale. We can put these into this framework. And then understanding really is only the first step. We really need to use that knowledge then to make predictions. And I think we do that by accumulating information into a, into a framework, developing a strategy then for understanding, and then how do we actually predict that? And that's the connectivity framework that I present. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Go ahead. I know a lot of concern about uh, you know the connectivity and the, and the effects it's going to have uh, has to do with you know our you know, our more uh, ease of transportation and the transport of invasive species and, and species around the world. And yet, a lot of the great examples we show don't have anything to do with people. Uh, so, yeah, I, it's towards the beginning I did in terms of spread of disease, right? So I just picked out a couple. But yeah, certainly there are lots more examples. And, and I'm glad that you could think of additional ones. So there really is an interesting thing once you start thinking about, you know, how, how insulated we sort of used to be. And these things have been going on for a long time, right? It's just that we now we have a great recognition of them. But yeah, there are lots more that are, are very important. So, so do, you have, do you have in your mind kind of a rank of when you have Of, of what? Um, the, the, the drivers of connectivity and their effects on the, I guess, on the world's ecosystem. Like how important they are? Yeah. Well, I think it depends on the question. So I think the, I mean, the first thing is to sort of say, well, what is, the, what is the major vector that's moving things around? And what is it moving? So if it's invasive species, is it driven by wind or water or animals or humans? Well, what is it that's driving it? And then what are the big scale sort of patterns in those drivers? And then how does that then, you know, as we go through our framework, how does that work down to say, okay, well, what do I need to do? What do I need to study? And actually studying these transfers are very important and very difficult. So you don't want to do it everywhere. And that's the other sort of key point is if, if there's not an obvious connection that's influencing your dynamics, then don't do it because they're very expensive. So we're doing with the Hornadas, we're actually stratifying the landscape, saying there are certain areas where, you know, there is really no connectivity going on, so don't bother to sample it. And there are other areas where we haven't sampled in the past, and it's really important, and I show those examples. So like that's probably the big thing, is figuring out where, when you need to do it, and then how, in terms of what are the vectors and where are the drivers. Thank you. Thank you. Are birds a, a, a form of connectivity?
activity? Sure, uh, yeah, a lot of juniper species are bird dispersed. So yeah, they actually disperse seeds and diseases as well. So they are an important source of uh, a transport vector of, of spread. So any animal community, fish, uh, with, with the change in the climate, uh, there will be all kinds of increasing connectivities there could be, and there could also be some reductions. The, the salmon movement up the, the rivers are disconnected, right? But there may be other fish that are actually more connected. That's right. How, I, uh, this is kind of probably going to be a big question, but how do we integrate like human-dominated systems and less-dominated areas? Because like LPR sites, they were all put in areas that were less impacted than right. humans. That's right. So now we're going to try to understand how everything's connected. And LTR sites aren't in, you know, pastures, and there's only one right. ag site. Do you have any ideas about how that could be in yeah. cities and agriculture? Yeah, so I'll show a slide tomorrow that, that I don't have in this presentation. But so the Hornada is about um, 40, so about 30 miles northeast of Las Cruces. In Las Cruces, if you, if you read the magazines and CNN and Money Magazine, everyone wants to move there. So Phoenix has gotten too huge and Tucson, and they're, and they're really hot. And so Santa Fe has gotten really expensive. So where's the next spot? Well, actually, Las Cruces is pretty nice because we're 3,800 feet in elevation. So if you look on the map, we're about 10 degrees cooler than Phoenix, and we're a lot cheaper. So people are moving there. So now we have housing developments moving right up against the Hornada. So there's a direct effect, right? So now all those people that actually have cats, you know, the cats are going to be out, so they have, they're planting lots of invasive species. So they're going to be moving into the, the rangeland that we haven't had these sorts of issues before. So that's one very direct, you know, where, where people are getting closer and closer, even to the Hornada, which has always sort of been seen as one of the more pristine, although we have, we have um, livestock management, but you have to always have to drive through a lot of desert to get to it. And now there's a golf course like within six miles. From, you know, it's just a housing development. So that certainly is actually, that's a focus of the Hornada LTER because we can't ignore it. You're right. And, and I think for us, um, you know, they've been studying sort of livestock grazing. I'll talk about this tomorrow for a long time. And I think they've got that figured out. And it doesn't mean that every rancher does it correctly. But we do know how many cattle for how long, you know, they got that sort of figured out. So I think the, the principal problem for us is, is other kinds of human activities whether it's ATVs or you know, all these other things that are actually coming into the desert or just houses being more adjacent to our, to our, private, to our public lands. So that is actually uh, a major shift sort of in focus for the LTRs, and some of us can sort of do it better than others. But it really is, you're right, we just can't ignore it. Just, yeah, and you can't just do a climate study, <laughs> right? Because you'll just, yeah, so what if it increases? And that's the point, the point tomorrow. So what if you know that increased precipitation if a housing development takes out your plot five years from now? Say that there is going to be another dust bowl situation. Um, you, this program that you're setting up, would then be able to predict it. I think that what we can do is provide insight into how to not have that happen. So right? you have points. How how would is that? You really can get those data points to, uh, to so that you can actually get data from all those different sites and bring them into one place. That's, that's part of the problem, is to actually get the data into one place where people can understand it. And you're succeeding with that? We are. We are, yeah. Because we, we've been mandated by NSF for, I don't know, 10 years or so, to put the data on their websites. And but you can't, I mean, I can't understand anybody else's data. <laughs> so that's the whole point of this, is to get it so you can actually understand it. So you, and you are succeeding at that. So we what are. would you do then? If someone is actually looking at that, yeah. Well, what you want to do is, is disconnect that system. So the biggest problem with the Dust Bowl is that everyone made an individual decision to plow their own land. It's just that everyone made the same decision, right? And, and interestingly, in, in 19, at the end, they went in and put in, that's when they put in the shelter belts, right? So they went and actually disconnected those systems and started planting trees, and that stopped the wind erosion. So I mean, that's what I think what you need to figure out, okay, we think that our, our plants are dying in lots of places. 
and we're seeing lots more soil erosion in lots of places. At what point do we need to do something? And we can only provide the information and whether actually people actually use it. But that's what they would have to do is they have to say, okay, am I going to be the one or a group of us? This has actually happened in the West with grazing, livestock grazing. They've gotten together and said, okay, as a group, we're going to decide that we're going to reduce stocking rates rather than just individually. And so that was what would need to happen is people would have to say, okay, look, here's the big picture, but these still are going to be individual decisions. And until people sort of group together to say, we're all going to make the same decision to disconnect this wind, right? To actually stop this wind erosion from my field and your field and your field, will it actually happen? And there is no mechanism at this point. Well, I think there are, no, I don't think so. I mean, there are certainly extension agents that are trying to sort of relay that information. But, but that's, you know, what I do is I try to get information in the hands of people that, so it's easy to access. And then people have to actually then implement that. I think that you would have to have someone who said, okay, I'm going to work on the Dust Bowl because I have 1,200 data sets, right, that I'm going to make available. So someone would have to say, I'm really interested in the Dust Bowl. And so they're going to go into those sites that are likely to be affected and look at precipitation and temperature and plant responses. And then they're going to, so it's going to still have to take someone who actually says, I have the question and I'm going to look for that data. But we're, provide, we're trying to just provide the data in an easy way that we think people can use for a broad array of questions. But it still will take someone who actually has the initiative and, and the quest to actually say, okay, you know, this is what we're going to do. So, so I've been talking to people in Argentina. They're worried because what's happening is uh, more and more of their lands are being cultivated to soybeans and being shipped to China. And it's increasingly marginal land and it's been wet, just like us in the Dust Bowl. And they're worried, based upon the, the U.S. print, you know, what's happened here, is that they're going to run into a dust bowl. And so we've been working with them, and well, how, many, how many fields can you actually cultivate before it gets very connected? And so that's the, trying, the information we're trying to provide. But it, the people have to decide whether they're going to actually you know, use it and, and go ahead with it. Isn't a large part of the problem, the perspective of the problems of the world, due to population pressures. I mean, I think of lands that at one time, like Zimbabwe, yeah. the breadbasket of Africa, which now starves. Yes. Uh, and do you plug those factors into your equation? Well, I think that what we're, what we're trying to do is provide a, a perspective that's bigger than just us, right? So we, and we get a sense of that from the news that, you know, that in some ways those problems connect us. Certainly, certainly they connect us sort of emotionally, but they can also connect us in terms of we're sending, you know, wheat over to those areas or whatever. So I think that what we're trying to do is to sort of put that into a framework that, and some of this is pretty obvious, that we are connected globally. and We need to recognize that those things are important. But I don't think that people have necessarily thought about it in terms of sort of how does it affect me in our, in our research. But in terms of, you know, I haven't talked a lot about, um, you know, you're, you're talking about some really serious problems in specific areas and how those are connected. And, and I think we would we have to sort of think about how that fits. But certainly we have to account for, I, mean, I think there's much greater recognition that we're connected to, to everyone and that we have consequences to other people in other countries. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but. Well, I think my question has no answer. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> However, I think this raises very important concepts for young students to think about. How would you advise a student to get background for this sort of thing? It seems to me it's so broad that um, you need a wide perspective. Well, certainly you need um, a bigger perspective. A lot of times we go out and we just look down, and that, that's the biggest thing. Is we can't just do plot scale sampling or plot scale thinking. You know, what's happening here? What's happening in my backyard? And it's only related to what's there. And we have to look at what might have happened in the past, what the future changes might be, what my neighbor's doing. I mean, that's, that's sort of the perspective is that actually a lot of things that happen are related to how things are connected. And it may not be the person right directly to me. It might be two miles down, right? It could be the river that flows through. And I think that what we're trying to do is just get that perspective out there and that thinking out there. But you would have to deal with economic pressures, mm -hmm. with 
business pressures, political pressures. Yeah. If if you I wanted to big sure. That's right. As yeah. well as exactly. So yeah. how do you prepare? Well, I think that it depends upon what you want to do. What you have to sort of pick your question and figure out what what is the box that you're dealing with. And for some questions, you don't need to go to economics. You don't need to go to political. You can actually do a lot if you're talking about ecological dynamics. I think you can sort of define your problem, and that's what students need to do. But what I'm suggesting is that when they define that problem, they also look around and make sure that they don't have something influencing them from other, some other place that, that's not obvious when they first set up their study. So I don't think that everybody has to do economics. And you know, When you look at the continental scale, certainly, and there are interdisciplinary groups that actually try to address these really big scale problems. And I think you're exactly right. Then you need lots of different expertise. But I think that people can fit themselves into here, because we need, you can't have you know, people who just know a little bit about a lot of things. You need the experts, right? And then somebody's got to sort of pull it together. We have two more questions. <laughs> I was just thinking down the line, do you think that in the future, expertise like yours could be used for zoning so we get shelter belts and things yeah. like that at the proper time? Yeah, exactly. And how do you arrange them? Right? So if they're all linear, the wind will go right down. <laughs> so that, that's what we need to figure out, right? Understand first and then how, how many do you need? How are they arranged? How big are they? I think that, that's really important. It certainly is appropriate to uh, global warming as a global issue that you can just plug it into the end of that first sentence. Uh, there are e important ecological, social, economic, and political consequences of global warming. Right. And you go from large to small scale. It fits perfectly. The discipline came along at a time when we really needed it. It looks like you could plug that to connectivity issue. In fact, the news people are doing it without even knowing it. Almost every night when they report it's issues true. around the world, yeah, it's true. important ecological issues that have political or economic impacts, such as melting of glaciers and the, what's going to happen when there's no more snow on the top of Kilimanjaro. You know, and all these issues, the breakup of the ice shield in Antarctica, it just goes on and on and on, and they have so much of what you're doing is seems so applicable to those kinds of large global to small scale issues. And talking about even the, you know whether or not uh, a lake trout will survive in in, in <coughs> Minnesota of 20 years from now, etc., because the lakes will be too warm. That's right. That's right. I think you can put a lot of response variables on well, the Weather Channel. <laughs> <laughs> You know what the weather is? Yeah, that's a great point. Okay. So it's, it's, it seems like it's interesting that uh, I think people are starting to understand the global connectedness of the economy. Um, do you think that that is kind of like that first step towards that global, or what, what more do we have to do to get to that ecological connectivity for folks, uh, including, including landowners in Iowa and operators? So what, what more do we need to? How do we, how do we get ecology into uh, the mindset of a corner of beans operating? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, because I mean, so I can tell you, like in my group, I'm, I'm, a, I'm actually a federal scientist, and our job is to do that, right? So we're supposed to work with the, the ranchers, and our, and our purview is the Chihuahuan Desert. And so we're supposed to provide knowledge and in, an insight to the, and so in our group though, so we have a group of people who are really good at that, because I'm not very good at that. And I think that that's one way to do it, is for scientists to actually communicate really well with the people who can talk to people on the ground. And rather than having everyone, we have 11 people in my unit, and rather than have every one of us try to do that, and some of us do it really poorly, <laughs> and some of us do it really well, we actually have people who focus on that. And so I talk to them regularly about these issues, and they're actually using these concepts now on, on hundreds of thousands of acres in the West uh, with the Bureau of Land Management uh, in terms of how they manage and actually looking at now around them instead of just, just down. So it, it's working in the West because we've been sort of infusing this, these concepts. And the way it works is that we have a group of people for which I can sort of focus on the science and then I transfer that information. I've got people who actually work. Because it, it, I think it's really an art to be able to talk to 
sort of the people who are doing this on the ground, and it doesn't necessarily a scientist's job to do that. But I think it's communication, and people actually are really good at that, need to then understand what the science is doing. Any one last question, perhaps? We can continue. To, oh, Dr. Oh, Bedinsky, do, do you have a question? <laughs> I really like your thoughts, but I was struck by the fact that when we think about conservation biology, we yeah. think about connectivity is a really good thing. Yeah. And a lot of what you're saying here is connectivity is a really bad thing in some situations. So uh, it's almost a, a, an issue of scale. Yeah. You know, so when you get within the, a continent, you're looking for connectivity, but when you're talking about between and among continents, you're looking for less potential. And so in some ways, part of, part of what we're talking about is uh, minimizing homogenization that's affected by humans and creating connectivity of potentially more pristine places and less connectivity of more modified places. Yeah, I think they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So it, what lots of, we go through all my examples, and I would guess that when I'm talking about increasing, there's another one that's decreasing. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly for us, it's grasslands are becoming more disconnected. Mm -hmm. and shovels are becoming more connected. And so I think there's going to be two arrows right. there for, for everything. And I just focused on one on one half of those. And I really haven't thought that much about the other one. I'm usually the, yeah. you guys are more experienced in that to talk about it. Because yeah. I think that we just have to add that other, certainly with the desert and grass on it works. I'm sure it works as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. <laughs> we can thank our speaker. And just before we go outside, and hopefully there's some refreshments waiting for us, but we'd like to give Deb a, a small token of our appreciation. Uh, we'd like to present you with two books by Paul Arrington of Men and Marshes and also his A Question of Values. And so thanks for coming out and, and uh, speaking with us. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> There should be snacks out here to help yourselves and eat it all, please. Eat it all, please. Eat it all, please. Eat it all.